Welcome back to Rasmafsar TV. I'm really happy to have Greg Malay. Greg is a good friend and we have been working together for a, quite a long period of time. So hi, Greg, welcome to Rasmafsar TV channel. Oh, well, thank you for having me, Manisha. I'm really happy to be here. And uh, we were joking just before we started recording that I brought my best, uh, you know, I've lived through a plague uh, uh, hair. It's not, not my midlife crisis, it's just a plague, but... Uh, so anyway, um, and, and my you know midlife crisis office because I do everything now in my home. So anyway, uh, but the thing that's been cool is that we get to do things like this. We all started realizing we could use this media. So I'm happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Greg, uh, could you please uh, introduce yourself to our audience, who you are? Yeah. Sure, of course. Um, so my name's uh, Gregory Mele, and I've been involved in what is, is now largely referred to as HEMA, but it had no such name since the mid 1990s. And uh, how that all came about is that um, as, a, as a teen, uh, well, really going all the way back to childhood, right? I, I actually blame my, my poor deceased father for this. You know, going back to childhood, um, he and I would spend Sunday mornings watching like old classic movies, you know, Errol Flynn movies and all of that. And, and my, my dad, you know, loved cowboy films and swashbucklers. So of course that's what I watched with him. And so, you know, he, we, like any good father, made me little wood swords, et cetera. And so from the time I was a kid, I wanted to know how, how knights fought, you know. And so I went through a lot of different paths we can talk about later through Asian martial arts, through reenactment, through modern fencing. Um, but what happened was actually, uh, this is kind of a, a funny story. I did a bad thing that worked out well, right? I, um, I went to the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, and uh, I was a double major in journalism and psychology. And um, it has a great journalism program. It actually has a good psychology program. But the psychology program was uh, largely all focused on behaviorism, which is very popular in America. And I realized that I hated it. I hated the approach. I hated everything about it. And I was going to drop the major. And I realized that I had hated this so much that I, so many of my elective hours were, um, were actually in the history program. And I was this close to getting a degree in medieval and ancient history. And I thought, well, I should just stick around an extra semester and get, get a second degree in history instead. Because who knows, maybe journalism doesn't pan out and I go back to graduate school for history. Now, as often is the case with young men in their very early 20s, they often have good ideas with poor execution. So my <laughs> poor execution, my poor execution was not realizing that two of the classes that I would need in order to get that degree were only offered in spring semesters. So it meant there was no way I could stay for just one more semester. I had to stay a whole nother academic year, right? So suddenly I had a summer down in Champaign and two other semesters and I um, had a very light class load and but a lot of time to myself. So uh, U of I has the third largest research library in the United States. And I thought, you know what, if there is anything on how medieval and Renaissance Europeans fought, it has to be here, right? There's gotta be something here. So I started researching this and I found uh, that there was this, this old book on the shelves called Schools and Masters of Defense by Egerton Castle, written in the late 19th century. And I dug it up and he was, he was very contemptuous of medieval swordsmanship. I should also point out because Castle gets beat up on the internet a lot. The man was 26 years old when he wrote this book and in multiple lectures later in life refined a lot of his ideas. But of course, people don't read that. They read the published book and they don't realize this. But Castle had referenced that. And he, so he referenced all these English uh, and, or all these Italian and German manuscripts and and French manuscripts and had said, you know, we don't really have anything in English until 1599 when this very old fashioned and reactionary man, George Silver, um, wrote these, these two books on, on how to fence with all these weapons, the sword and buckler and the sword and the quarterstaff and the bill. And I thought, holy crap, that's, that's it. And so I thought, well, I wonder, I doubt the library will have anything. And it turned out that they had an 1899 edition that had been reprinted called The Complete Works of George Silver. And it had sat in the undergraduate library and had not been checked out for 60 years. So I went and checked it out and promptly photocopied it. And this was how things started. And then in the rare book room, they had a number of these Renaissance Italian manuscripts. And my family, my father's family is Italian. I'm Italian and Irish and English and uh, her, um, by heredity. And uh, I had grown up 
you know, speaking Italian and I'd forgotten a lot of it, but I still knew some and I could still read some. And so I thought, well, I should look at these Italian manuscripts. And so that began a process. And, um, and this would have been 1993. And uh, so, um, so we started, I started working with some friends trying to reconstruct silver because I could read the English. It was Elizabethan English, which is, you know, perfectly easily read by, uh, by any modern speaker. Um, and uh, that was how it began. And I found out that there were some other things from that period translated into English, like Degrassi. And so it was kind of a mishmash. And then what happened was around 1995, um, a gentleman who is uh, kind of the, I think of as the, the real godfather of all this um, is a man, especially in America, named Stephen Hick. And um, he was able to uh, hook me up with a copy of Fiore de Libri's work, The Flower of Battle. And so here was a real honest to God medieval manuscript or you know, turn of the Renaissance, right? The late 14th century, 1409 is when he wrote. So he lived in the late 14th century. And this was, was truly a, a chivalric manuscript. We were talking, you know, armored combat of knightly combatants, mounted combat, all those things. And that was exactly what I'd been looking for. And, uh, and you know, and I haven't looked, I haven't looked back, so. Okay. And, um, okay, great. that's very interesting. So do you, yeah. tell us please, what exactly do you teach as far as European and Western martial arts are concerned? Sure. sure. So. So what happened was, um, so I started this research process and by 1999 realized that, you know, um, um, you know, the reenactors have their own interests and the SCA had its own interests and that really, if I was going to do this, I needed a dedicated space. And so we created the Chicago Swordplay Guild. And, um, and so we created the, the guild to focus on European martial arts. And then we very quickly narrowed in on Italian martial arts. Um, and, and that was because my co-founder, Mark Rector, um, he and I met online. We didn't know each other. He had two friends who were working with Italian rapier, and I had these friends who were working with, with the medieval weapons, and it seemed a good a match. And so what we focus on as a school are the Italian martial arts, um, the, both, the, uh, both the ones that are extinct, and now to some extent, thanks to some more recent contacts I've made, on the, the stick and knife traditions that are still alive. My personal work focuses primarily on the work of Fiore de Libri and the tradition that he left called armizare. Armizare just means to be in arms, right? So the, the, the art of arms or the knightly art. Um, but I also uh, teach um, a, a parallel tradition that grew up just maybe a generation or so later from Bologna, which for people who don't know their Italian geography, is really only about a day and a half by horse away. So we're, we're really talking central, central or Northeastern Italian traditions. And they're very obviously closely related. So my focus is on these martial arts that are from the 14th to mid 16th century. And then other members of my school focus a little bit later on the traditions of the 16th and early 17th centuries. And what kind of weapons do you teach at your school? Could you explain them? Yeah, so we do everything um, from the knightly arsenal uh, other than mounted combat. And I do have um, some students who do mounted combat out in Colorado, but, but we don't. And I, um, and I admit, I kind of find it as a, a personal failing. Um, I admit, I can ride a horse and that's about what I can say about my riding skills. I'm also unbelievably allergic to horses. So every time we work with them, it is, uh, they're lovely animals, but oh my God, I, I, I suffer for a day and a half afterwards. Um, but so we teach uh, wrestling, uh, which is done in and out of armor. We teach um, dagger and dagger defense, which again is done in and out of armor. The one-handed sword and the two-handed sword, um, the spear, uh, there is also a weapon called the Giavarina, which uh, some people will know as um, uh, sometimes curators call it a bohemian ear spoon, right? It's really an early form of partisan. So it's, it's a long slashing spear blade. You know, maybe I can't quite fit my hands on camera. Let me lean back. So, you know, maybe about the length of your, up to the length of your forearm with a pair of wings that come off of it on a long haft. And, um, and then there's the pole axe, which is really in most cases a pole hammer. Uh, you know, in, in Europe, they had both an axe-bladed weapon and a hammer-bladed weapon. 
And the strange thing I wanna share is that the fencing manuscripts for whatever reason, almost universally show the um, hammer bladed weapon, not the ax blade, even though it's called a pole ax, it really is a pole hammer. And no, I have no explanation I can give you for that. Um, other than I think that um, other than Fiore, most of these texts that show the weapon, we start moving into the era where the halberd is also evolving for use by foot soldiers. And so maybe these guys are trying to draw a distinction there. I don't know. Um, but so those are the weapons that we focus on is a one and two handed sword, the dagger wrestling, um, the lance or spear, uh, the slashing spear and the pole hammer in and out of armor. And then on the Bolognese tradition, we have also the sword and buckler and the sword and shield. Okay. Before we go ahead, because um, at not Razzosar TV, especially our new channel is mostly watched now by martial artists and who yeah. are not into weapons, right? So that's right. the reason, you know, that's the reason I'm asking these questions. Don't know why is yeah. it? Could you explain to our, uh, because there are many wrestlers, Kyukushin, Karate, uh, MMA yeah, fighters course. now watch. Could you explain, because you know, I have some questions I always ask, ask these people, that's why I'm asking. Yeah. What is the difference between, um, what did you say, long sword and one and a half sword? Please explain this. Sure, absolutely. So. So Fiore really teaches a single weapon that can be used in one or two hands. And so people ask me, you know, what is a long sword? What's a two handed sword? What's a hand and a half sword? All right, so what, what that, that term hand and a half sword is essentially a modern term. Um, sometimes it's called a bastard sword, which is a medieval term. But really that just means a weapon that is essentially a one handed sword blade, say something that is, and I'm American, so everyone's gonna have to put up with my imperial measurements, I apologize. I, I, I can translate, but not on the fly. Um, so, so say, you know, about 32 to 35 inches, so a little under a meter, right? Maybe 95 centimeters um, is the, the length of the blade. And then you, uh, and it, but it has a hilt just long enough you can slip a second hand on there. Now the weapon Fiori, shows is a little bit bigger. It's primarily, the long sword is primarily a two-handed sword, but we don't mean these big giant weapons. We mean something that is, you know, probably about 39 inches of blade, maybe four feet overall. So, you know, certainly not more than a meter and a half in length um, and a weight of about, you know, three to three and a half pounds. So a little over, a little over a kilo and a half. Um, they're very nimble. They're they're, they're essentially the counterpart, since everyone knows it better. They're really the, the counterpart way to think of it is the hand and a half sword or bastard sword is the counterpart to a katana. And the long sword is the counterpart to the tachi for people who know their Japanese weapons, right? Uh, many in Japanese watch this channel. Thank you. Exactly. So I think that way, it's a good way for people to relate to it. Oh, okay. And uh, uh, the question which I have uh, uh, for you as well, could you please explain this knightly sword, which were one-handed, were they used single-handedly or always in conjunction with the shield? Both, both. Um, initially, it was primarily meant to be a, a, a secondary weapon. And that's why, for example, previous to the era of these manuscripts, if you look at Viking swords, right, they have these very small guards. I mean, you look at it and you think, boy, that, that's not going to do much of anything for your hand. But of course, you know, as you know, once you're using a shield in the other hand, there's a way to, you know, the shield is often covering the sword. It can move in conjunction. You don't need a large developed grip um, because you have this other tool. And the idea isn't really to constantly tangle your weapon up. It's to it's to be using that to be using the weapons in conjunction and separating and you know you can parry with the sword and transfer with the shield so very dynamic. What happens is um, as the knightly armor becomes more complete in the 14th century, the shield starts to become less and less needful. And in some ways, I think this is maybe what's a little bit different from European arts from everything else. You know, the only two other cultures I can think of that really developed a full heavy armor would be Persia and, you know, and the Turks, um, that, that kind of that strip of Asia and then Japan, right? You know, you don't see as heavy armors in, in kind of the spaces in between there. Um, but the European plate armor, of course, is probably the most complete. And so the shield starts to become a little superfluous. And so what we see is, is um, the, the sword then can be used without the shield, especially when you're on horseback. Um, because the shield is either just slung on a strap or eventually 
just the plate armor develops a large shoulder that works like this while I'm, I'm riding my horse and I can use the sword alone. And once that happens, that's what frees up the use of a two-handed sword, that move into that hand and a half or two-handed sword. Okay, so it means that uh, those swords were used in conjunction with, a, with an armor, together with an armor, right? Right, and when they're not, then it's used with certainly with a shield. And that's why I think the buckler, the little round shield, remained so popular really until um, the time of the rapier, which if you think about it, that big hilt, is you just took a buckler, you drilled a hole in the middle and you slid your blade through it, right? That's right. And now, and now your buckler's built into your sword. But, but really, no armor, there's some sort of shield. With armor, by the late Middle Ages, you don't need a shield anymore. Okay. Another question which we have, and I know it's going to open a can of worms here. Do you, you know, these questions I have here, do you edge parry or do you flat parry? I don't know why this, I think this is a beloved question. You know, I don't know who, it is, why it this is. question is here, but. Oh, it, it, and you know what? And unfortunately I'm old enough now, Monisher, and I've been around long enough. I know why it is. Cause these were these heated debates in the nineties. And, um, and uh, it's not even worth going into the, the history of it, but I, but I, but it's, I can answer it. So the answer is yes. You do both, um, but let me talk about how parrying is discussed. So first of all, parrying with the sword in the European tradition, cuts are both attacks and defenses. So quite often a cut is also a parry. So obviously if you cut at me and I counterattack you, right? Or if you cut at me and I parry with the back edge of my sword and then make an attack, that's obviously with the edge, right? but I'm not slamming my edge into your sword. I'm, I'm deflecting it, I'm cutting through it. And, um, you know, uh, for example, um, you said there's a lot of Japanese viewers, uh, obviously things like the, uh, the famous Itoru has, you know, has, there has a whole tradition of cutting through the opponent's attack. Very, very similar idea. Um, and I was just watching some, some, uh, some beautiful uh, video of uh, Yagyushin Kageru, and they have a, a very similar set of plays to what we see in Fiori, where that, that idea is done. You simply cut through the attack to strike with the point. So that is that is obviously done with the edge. Then there's another way to parry with the sword. For example, if I'm closing into a grapple, right? And I will use the part of the sword. Um, I don't have a sword that I can put on camera, but here's a Bowie knife trainer, so this will work, right? Where I'm gonna receive your attack right here near the guard, obviously the guard is longer, and I'm gonna take it on what we'd call my forte or the strong. And this part of the sword isn't really sharp anyway, right? It's often blunt. So, and I'm then I'm making the stopping motion with the idea that I can grip the blade, I can grapple, I can make a disarm. So that sort of action is another way to parry, and that is with the edge. Um, and then there are a small, a small curriculum of flat parries that we see. Um, we see them called out as such in the German tradition of the 16th century, and we can infer some in other sources. There's a couple mentioned in the, by uh, Achille Marozzo in 1536, and these are always for a very particular reason, and these are for things a lot like, for example, Filipino traditions call them roof blocks, right? Where you want the sword, and the Germans call it, I, I can't remember the German, but the English translation is running off you know, one great thing about the German language is that it's so very literal in how it, it puts its, its words, its compound words together. And so what do I want the sword to do? Well, I want it to run off. And then I don't want it to stop. So I don't want it to hit the edge and stick. So I can turn my flat and let it slide apart. So the answer is we do all of the above. We use the edge more than the flat but we also use these very dynamic um, percussive beats and deflections more than we use hard blocks. Okay. Very good. Another question which I have, where European swords, or European swords, what kind of question is that? I think they mean like these uh, two-handed sword or long sure, sword, yeah, yeah. that's what, it, were they sharp? Yes, okay. Yes, they're not blunt crowbars. Um, so, and this, of course, is the fault of movies, right? This is the fault of movies. So you see these guys slamming swords into things or, or beating each other in plate armor. So, um, you know, I, oh, I see my camera hated that. Give me one moment, I'll clear up my video. Okay, I'll keep talking though. So um, there we go. So obviously you cannot cut through plate armor, 
right? And so the sword was not meant to be used like that. When you're fighting a man in plate armor, you're going to thrust into the gaps of his armor. Um, you're not going to try to, um, to cut it. So that's the first thing. And so movies create this idea that these things must be crowbars. But they're very light. They're very nimble. Um, you know, anyone who has handled a, a good Chinese John would be perfectly comfortable with a European straight sword. They're very similar weapons. Anyone who is, has handled, you know, Japanese swords would feel very at home with a long sword. They might have to get used to the straight blade and having two edges, but, but in the hand, it feels very, very familiar. Um, so they are sharp. Now, we have some interesting advice that a few masters give us. And what they tell us is that that last hand's length of, from the point, right, that last hand's length, uh, more or less from the point to the point of percussion should be very sharp, very, very sharp. And then it becomes progressively less sharp all the way down to the forte, which is going to be blunt. So what that suggests and what my experience just looking at swords um, that we don't think have been over polished by collectors over the years, and of course, sometimes this is guesswork, right? Is that, is that a, a sword meant to be used on the battlefield is very sharp in the last few edge, uh, um, inches, you know, say the last six inches. And then it's sharp kind of like a good, a good ax or a good tool, but not like a modern hunting knife. Because obviously if it hits a shield or a sword or something like that, and it's that hard, you risk the, or that sharp, you risk, you risk chipping it. And that's not the part you need to cut with anyway. So, of course. Another question I have, and this is my own question. We know that, you know, for example, lots of Viking swords or many of them, they're um, welded steel or the so-called pattern welded steel. And we know that in the middle where the fullers are, you can clearly see the welded. We have mm -hmm. some colleagues who uh, had an um, hypothesis that some of these Ulfprecht actually came from Persia. I, th I think you heard about that. You read mm -hmm. about that. So they were crucible steel made. So I don't want to go into that role because there are lots of discussions. Were yeah. the Ulfprecht, all of them crucible steel or not? But let's stick to welded steel. I know I handled <laughs> many of them in museums, which clearly show welded steel. And Persian manuscripts talk about the Rus, means the Vikings in Persian yeah. Rus, when they, back then, I mean, not today, Rus today is Russians, right? But <laughs> back yes. then they called them Rus, right? Yeah, when they came to trade uh, with us, they always had swords, which in the middle looked like, you know, a snake, which was turning mm -hmm. around. So, you know, it's very right. beautiful to read that. Oh, yes. So this is this manuscript I'm translating. They always talk about these swords and there are different types of snakes in the middle. Okay. But then the question for me is, we know that um, they are welded steel. And I remember, I remember Manfred Sachse, the German you know, smith, he published a book a couple of years ago, a long time ago, 25 years ago, where he shows some antiques. And then you can see he polished some even like rapier blades. And to my, I was so stunned, not all of them, but some of them showed pattern welded steel pattern. Some of them, not all of them. So the question, very interesting, you know, because that's what's the last thing I expected from a rapier blade, right? Yeah, of course. Very, of course. very, very astonishing for me. Not all of them. I repeat, please, please, I'm not saying all of them. Some right. of them, guys, right? But still, right, you understand. So we know that, for example, let's say in the Viking period, or also a bit later than the Viking period, lots of welded steel. We don't talk about Ulfbrecht, let's, Okay, we don't talk about crucible steel or not. Let's forget about it. Right. We know that they were wild steel. So now when we come to medieval Europe or Renaissance, right? Let's, mm -hmm. let's stick to medieval. Let's stick to uh, two-handed sword or long sword or bastard sword. Were they blades wilded or not? That's the question which I always have. 